Well, good morning. My name is Caleb. I'm so privileged to be with you already for the first service and then for this one. And it's not a competition, um, but I think you guys brought more energy in the second one. Yeah, let's go. I'm just saying. Um, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here and I'm so thankful. Um, we traveled out um, on Friday and then came into town late last night um, with my family. I think we have a picture. Uh, my name is Caleb, my wife Ruthie. Um, she's right here, right down the front this morning. My wife, can we thank her for all that she does for um, my family? I'm so thankful for her and, and um, she's God's greatest gift to me. And uh, we traveled out here, and then uh, my son on the right of the picture there, Gatlin, and our daughter, Scotland. And uh, man, we're so thrilled to be with you here in church this morning. It's an honor. It's a privilege. Um, We've known about you for a while, ever since God moved Pastor Blake and Lisa out here, and then, of course, Michael and Abby as well. And so um, I'm honored to be here, and I just want to honor a few people, a few groups here in the room first. Um, Blake and Lisa. Blake and I served on staff together at Southern Hills for five years. And um, boy, you talk about, even as he came up here and just did announcements this morning, you talk about someone um, that just had God's gift, God's hand upon him in leadership and um, in stewardship and teaching and training people. And I've watched him around the campus this morning. I still call him regularly for advice. I'm like, Blake, what would you do, WWPD? What would Blake do? I'll call him and I'll be like, hey, bro, like, like what would you do here? Um, and um, we remain connected. I think some people, you've probably experienced this in your life, um, come in and out of your life for a little season. And then there are some people, no matter where they're at geographically, um, you're meant to do life together. And we feel that way about Blake and Lisa. We love them and are thankful for them. And um, I was thinking about um, Paul says this about Timothy when he sends Timothy to the Philippian church. He says, I, I have no one so like-minded who will genuinely care for you. And I think you have a pastor and family and pastor's wife in Blake and Lisa. Can we just honor them that care for you and care for you well? And uh, we're thankful for them. And uh, we love you. Um, October's Pastor Appreciation Month. So I just want to honor him and, and encourage you to do so as a church family. And then secondly, Michael and Abby, when we first moved to Las Vegas, um, Michael and I did almost everything together. He stepped into the student ministry. I'd, I'd moved there as a student ministry pastor, and um, he led uh, worship for me. And it didn't matter if it was 30 students, which is where we started, to 150 students, which is where we ended. And um, he just would step in. And uh, there, there's a lot that goes into leading worship. At least that's what they tell me. I don't lead it. So uh, there, there's a lot that goes into it. And I've seen people who are Um, on key and they do everything just right and they're great vocalists and all those things but there's something unique when someone steps into this place and position as a worship leader and has the anointing of God on him and them and I feel that way about Michael and about Abby Psalm says this God inhabits the praises of his people don't you feel like the Lord has already been with us this morning through praise and through worship we thank the Lord for that praise God And uh, the last one is, man, I honor you, um, church, for your faithfulness. My my wife and I have grown up in church, different churches across the South, and then we met at a church in Bible college and seminary, and um, then moved out to the West Coast. We were at church there. We served in at a church in Houston, Texas, for seven years. Now we're in Las Vegas together. And I'll, I'll tell you this: in my history of um, attending churches and serving at churches. When you're in a church that's unique and genuinely desires to reach people for Jesus and fulfill the Great Commission, you are in a very special place. And I'm telling you right now, you are in a special place from the moment we walked on campus. We we honor you, church family. Thank you. Uh, From the moment we we drove on campus, there are people telling me to honk at them, and I didn't know if I was in the way or if it was like, no, just be happy you're here, uh, but we've had such a good time. Worship has been good, and and I'm I'm privileged to um, dive in, continue the book of John with you this morning. We're going to be in John 15, and we're diving into a new sermon series, uh, which I'm privileged to preach the first sermon in called Take Heart, Take Heart from John 15. Most scholars believe that this was an ongoing sermon that Jesus taught at the close of the Last Supper. So in essence, this is from John 14 on, this is the farewell sermon of Jesus. He's about to teach his disciples truly how to take heart, and 
he knew that after he left, his disciples would be tempted to leave him. They'd be tempted to leave each other. They'd be tempted to shrink back from their calling when met with hardships, that this discipleship process that they were in would be difficult, and they'd be tempted to do that. And imagine the the disciples gathered there, heads full of knowledge about what to do, how to cast out demons, how to heal, how to teach, how to preach. They'd watched Jesus for three years. They, They knew what to do. But Jesus knew that they didn't need more head knowledge. They needed more heart courage. Jesus knew that as they were entering this new phase and Jesus would be betrayed and then Jesus would go to the cross and uh, he would fulfill his calling here on earth. He knew that before they were about to try and do ministry and everything they were called to as disciples that they needed to be with Jesus just a little while longer. Let's read the passage together this morning. John 15, we'll start in verse one, we'll end in verse eight. Not a lengthy passage, but let's read it here this morning. John 15, verse one. Jesus says this, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch in me that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Again, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. And here's the sermon sentence. Here's the crux of what Jesus is saying. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. That phrase again, Jesus says, for apart from me, you can do nothing. Let's pray a blessing of the reading and soon to be the teaching of God's word this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you again for your goodness and your grace. Lord, as we spend some time at your feet this morning, God, we pray that uh, your word would fall fresh upon us. We pray that your spirit would minister to us. God, we pray that uh, these truths that you taught your disciples over 2,000 years ago would be just as truthful, just as powerful in our lives this morning. God, that we would remember that you've called us to something special, something unique, and that we wouldn't get that uniqueness, that calling out of order. God, encourage us, strengthen us, challenge us this morning as we spend some time in your word. And then, God, I pray a special blessing upon this church, upon all that are gathered here this morning. May we be in your presence and go out with your presence. We love you. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Before the disciples of Jesus got caught up in what they were doing, they were getting ready to be commissioned. They'd been trained by Jesus for three years now. They were heads full of knowledge. They were getting ready to go out. Before they did that, Jesus had one final sermon, one big truth. And we're going to pull three practical applications out of it this morning. Jesus wanted them to remember who they were abiding in before they ever tried to do what they were called to do. The first truth we see this morning is this. We must abide in the person of Jesus Christ. He's preaching. He's teaching them this message. And as he gets to John 15, as we categorize it, Jesus is just in the flow. And in John 15, he says this, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. And then in verse five, he says, I am the vine You are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Jesus is leaning in and he's 
asking his disciples to learn this truth that they must abide, be with Jesus. It's so nice to be with you, church family, this morning. It's so nice to be back on the East Coast. I actually was born in the state of Vermont. Um, I grew up on the East Coast, and uh, we came out here uh, late on Friday, and as a family, we uh, woke up the very next morning, and we stepped out into the beautiful, cool weather, and we just breathed it in. Just We could smell the leaves and the trees and the humidity and all that stuff in there, and it just smells like the way God intended it to smell, amen, on the East Coast. And I was like, oh, this is beautiful in Las Vegas. If you step outside and you breathe, what you smell is concrete and marijuana and, you know, all all the good things. And uh, you say concrete doesn't have a smell. I promise you in Las Vegas it does, okay? Uh, concrete smells there. And uh, it's so nice to be out here. And, and it reminds me of as a, as a kid growing up, I actually grew up on a small dairy farm. My family owned and operated a small dairy farm in Vermont. And uh, I grew up doing that. And I remember when I was about second or third grade, I went to school and my teacher had a project for us. And the project that she had for us was fill it out, kind of some FAQs about you. And one of the questions that she asked every student in the class to fill out was, what do you want to be when you grow up? And growing up on a dairy farm, I could only think of one great calling in life. And it was to be a dairy farmer (laughs) Um, as my generations before me. And so I wrote that on the uh, paper and then they had you draw what that would look like. And so I think I drew a cow and and a self-portrait. And here's what I knew God was not calling me to. He was not calling me into art, okay? Uh, There are much more gifted people in the world than, than me. And so as I drew that and as I wrote that, I internalized this question probably like you've done and probably like you've asked someone else or probably that you've been asked yourself, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I internalized that as, what am I going to do? And see, so often we think who we are is what we do, but God has not made you to be a human doing. God has made you to be a human being. And oftentimes we get those reversed to where what we do matters way more than who we are. Oftentimes we start with, well, well, here's what I'm going to do. And as we come to the John 15 passage before Jesus leaves, he is hitting the reset button in the hearts of his disciples. And he's reminding them that before you ever do for Jesus, you must take time to be with Jesus. Otherwise, what you'll find yourself doing is doing more for you and maybe even out of goodwill, doing more for others. But when you haven't taken time to be with Jesus, your doing will not flow right. Psalm 139 says it this way. The psalmist's heart cry was this. He said, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties and see if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. To be with Jesus is far more important than to do for Jesus. But here's the beautiful truth. When you spend time being with Jesus, you will also get up from that place and go and do for Jesus in the right way. Uh, think, Think about it this way. Jesus is giving a horticultural illustration here. He's saying, I am the vine and you are the branches. Think about it in this terminology. Jesus is cultivating you. And he does so when you spend time with him. Uh, Imagine a garden that has good seeds planted in it. I don't know what you would plant in your garden. I know as a kid growing up, uh, we grew rhubarb in our garden. You don't get that out in Las Vegas, but that was one of the things. Maybe it's strawberries. Maybe it's blueberries. I hear they're big out here. Maybe it's blackberries. But imagine you plant good seed in your garden. And even as you plant that, The restriction is that the gardener is never allowed to visit. Imagine what would happen to that garden. Other seeds would blow in, dandelions and crabgrass and thistles and poison ivy maybe and goldenrod. All these things would blow in and they would begin to crowd out, to choke out what you had initially planted. This is the illustration that Jesus is giving. And if you think about this in the context of, remember, Jesus is going to the cross and there he'll die and then he'll be buried and he'll rise again the third day. But think about this. When he rose again the third day, Mary runs to the garden 
And as Mary runs to the garden, the body is already gone. And so she looks around and she's trying to ask the question, what have you done with the body of Jesus? And it's recorded in the Gospel of John just later in the chapters. And she asked this question. Here's the phrase that as she looks around for the body of Jesus, she sees someone and supposing him to be the gardener, she says, where have you laid Jesus? Little did she know that it was Jesus himself who now is in the person of the gardener who many scholars believe had taken on the form of the ancient of days as he'll come back in Revelation. And she sees him and asks him, supposing him to be the gardener, asks him this question, where is Jesus, this is who Jesus is to us truly. And when the garden of our hearts are left unattended because we don't go visit the gardener, we also have seeds that are blown in by the winds of this world. I think about your heart, think about my heart, that instead of going to Jesus, if he plants seeds and the fruit of the spirit in our life, but we don't spend time with Jesus asking him to cultivate us, this world will blow in the seeds of frustration, the seeds of bitterness. This world will blow in the seeds of anger and pride and denial and hostility. And pretty soon, both the garden of your heart and soul and the garden of my heart and soul will look a little bit less like Jesus and a lot more like the world. Have you experienced that in your walk with Jesus that as you go, it's like, man, where, where did all these emotions, where did all this frustration, where did all these issues come from? The first truth that we see that Jesus is reminding his disciples of is that you must abide in me. It starts with a person spending time with Jesus. How can we spend time with God real practically? There's a book I read not too long ago called Sacred Pathways by Gary Thomas. And in it, he talks about how through history, through the last two millennia, the church has had a couple different ways that they've spent time with God. One is the, the uh, naturalists. It's those of us who walk outside and we breathe in the fresh air and the creation of God. And immediately we're like, oh, yes, I know there is a God. God is so good and God is so great. And I spent a lot of my years in youth ministry. So forgive me if I ask you to interact with me here a little bit this morning. But how many of you, that's you, you walk outside and you're like, oh, the creation of God is just so beautiful. How many of you are like me and, and you're a naturalist? Man, man, that's me. How many of you are like, no, 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 I don't need the outside air. I have the freshest air around called AC. It's inside and I'll stay inside and I'll be fine inside. And, and you lean into uh, maybe it's um, silence and solitude. Where, where my young family's at. And you're like, would to God that I had some silence and solitude, right? Because uh, you got little kids running around and, and you find Jesus in those moments of silence and solitude. Uh, maybe for you, it's uh, spending time in the word. Think about what John says in the beginning of his gospel, that in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Do you want to spend time with the gardener who will begin to work and cultivate your soul and your heart, find ways to get to him? And a great way is spending time with his word, because when you open up the word of God, you open up the mind of God and he begins to work in you and through you and work things out of you. How about this prayer? Spending time with God in prayer and not just like going to pray and saying, hey, God, here's here's the list of all the things that I need. But going to prayer and accessing what God wants and has for you. I like what Martin Luther said. I think so often we can view prayer just as a task or a chore to be done. But Martin Luther said this. He said prayer is not overcoming God's reluctance, but laying hold of his willingness Prayer is this connection point with God where I step into it with all my wants and all my worries. Think about how Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father which art in heaven, not here's my list, but our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Prayer is this moment of connection to God that as I center myself on who God is, this world shrinks in comparison to the majesty and greatness of God. And immediately I'm transformed into this place and, and this opportunity to spend time with Jesus and all my worries and all my anxieties, though I carry them heavy, I rest them at the feet of Jesus and they become light. 
His way is easy. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. And I spend time with Jesus and immediately my world is arrighted. And I think, oh man, thank you, Jesus, for pruning these things out of me. And don't miss this. In John 15, the branches grow because they are connected to Christ, the root. This is the hidden life with Christ of the believer. You don't see it, but you see the fruit of it. You know when someone has been with Jesus by the way they show up to work. You know when someone has been with Jesus by the way they get home from work. You know when someone has been with Jesus by the way they show up to church on Sunday. Amen. You know when someone has been with Jesus because not because you see the root, but because you see the fruit of it. Can I ask you and can I ask myself a challenging question? Am I so busy doing for God that I'm neglecting just being with God? Maybe what Jesus wants first and foremost, according to John 15, is that I would spend time connected to the vine first, and that when it comes to doing for God, I'd embrace the gift of limitations and say, God, I know I can't do everything. What would you have me do for you? Because I will not neglect spending time with you. What a gift as we read John 15 to remember and to realize first, number one, there's the person. How can we as the disciples 2000 years ago took heart? How can we take heart? First, we spend time with the person of Jesus. Second, we submit ourselves to the process of pruning. Now, if I was writing John 15 and I'm Jesus and I'm about to go out and be crucified, I would put all good things in John 15. I'd be like, hey, I love you and you're great and you're gifted and you're amazing and just spend time with me. I'd write all the good stuff. But Jesus leans in and says, abide in me. Without me, you can't do anything. And when you abide in me, I'm going to begin to prune some things out of you. Because every good gardener knows, just like we mentioned earlier, that as you go through life, you pick up things that you should not carry. You pick up truths that are not truths. You pick up habits that are not holy, and you begin to carry them. Look at John 15 too. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. I like this quote from Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan, who's known for winning. Michael Jordan, who's known for championships. Michael Jordan, who's known for success. Michael Jordan says this, I like control. (laughs) Isn't there a little bit of that in all of us? That when it comes to our life, like, okay, John 15, yeah, that's, that's good, and yeah, that's cool, and absolutely, I want to connect with Jesus, but what does that actually mean? I think we'd rather sit in the seat of control than we would surrender to the process of pruning. And oftentimes, what Jesus does as we spend time with him is he says, I'm so glad you're here. Let me help you take some things out of your life that are not helping you. I put a picture up of, of my son and daughter and my wife. My son's name is Gatlin, and uh, there's this place for my Vegas peeps in uh, Las Vegas that um, if you drive uh, on Rainbow Boulevard and you go over 215, just inside the 215, there's this place called Kids Town. And Gatlin and Scotland, my kids, they love Kids Town. It's an indoor child-sized town where kids can pretend play. There's a hamburger shop, a pet hospital, a pizza shop, a grocery store. It's all inside and it's all kid size. And so we'll go in there and they have the little things built and you kind of have to step down to go into one of them. And um, I'll go in there and Gatlin will be like, daddy, come in here. Uh, I'm making pizza. And I'll be like, awesome. He'll be like, I made you some pizza. You have to pay for it. And I'm like, awesome. How much for the slice? And he's like, $50. And I'm like, You're going to make it in this world, kid. You know what I mean? Like, uh, you've got it going on. And so uh, I'm like, okay, 50 bucks. And so I pretend pay him. And and Gatlin loves that place. He he loves to play where things are just his size and he's in full control. And uh, being in Las Vegas, Disneyland is only about four hours south of us. And so right before Gatlin turned three, I don't know if you know this, but Disneyland has this thing where um, if they're three, if they're under three, they're free. Um, What they don't tell you is nothing else in the park is free. Like, it's really a a really good uh, plan to get young families there. Um, And so we're like, ah, we want to take, I didn't grow up, uh, grew up on the East Coast, so I didn't grow up going to Disneyland. So we're like, we want to take the kids. And uh, my wife is uh, really the the visioneer for all that. And she plans things so well. And she's like, hey, we want to take the kids down there. And I'm like, okay, awesome. Let's do it. And so we planned everything out. She bought the tickets. We're ready to go. And we wanted to surprise Gatlin before his third birthday. 
And so we went to go tell him and I got right down with him and I'm like, Gatlin, you're never going to believe it. You're about to be three and we're going to get you. We're going to take you to visit. And before I could finish, he goes, kids town. And I was like, no, 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 no. And I tried to bring him back to reality and say, no, no, no. We're going to take you to visit Disneyland. And now he stepped back and was kind of like, what? He's like, no, 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 no. I want to go to kids town. And I realized in that moment, I could have saved a lot of money is what I realized. I realized in that moment that he didn't have any concept of what Disneyland was because he had never been there. What he knew and what he loved was the place he could, tr- could control called Kids Town. And so I leaned down. I said, no, 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 buddy. I'm telling you, you're going to love Disneyland. And he didn't believe me for the first couple days. He didn't believe me for the four-hour drive. He didn't like the four-hour drive down there. He didn't believe me. But when we walked into Disneyland, guess who was a believer now? Amen. Uh, he's like, Dad, Disneyland. Mom, Disneyland is great. This is amazing. They love Disneyland. And watch this. How many times do we, as the father leans over, us and says, I've got something good for you. I've got something great for you prepared. And we say, no, no, no. I like this world where I control everything. And God says, you have not yet begun to know what I have in store for you. I want to open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing so much you will not have room to receive it. And we're like, but I'm really comfortable over here. And God says, I know the process will be uncomfortable, but I have something great in store for you. Will you trust me with the process of pruning? And he's a good father who leans over us and calls us in as the Holy Spirit hovers over our life, calls us into some places that we've never been before that are greater than anywhere we've been as of yet. Amen. Isn't that true about God as he leans over us? Just uh, we came in Friday. And just yesterday, we went to Hershey Park, right? And so we took the family, went to Hershey Park. We had a great time. And the very last ride, it's a roller coaster, and it's like a 30-minute wait. And so we're standing in line. About halfway through, Gatlin is like, I don't, I don't know if I want to wait. I don't know if I want to do it. Like, like, I don't know if this is worth it. And we finally get to the very end. And he's like, I don't think I'm going to ride. We get to the very end. And Ruthie, my wife, his mom, is like, Gatlin, I think you're going to enjoy it. And so he's like, okay, fine, I'll do it. And he got on the roller coaster and he went around. And literally, we're walking off the roller coaster and they're both running, Gatlin and Scotland. They're like, Hershey Park is amazing. This is amazing. This is great. And sure enough, they went through the process And they realize this is actually really, really good. And I wonder how many times we get frustrated in the process. We struggle through the story. We don't know where it's heading, but I'm telling you, when we start by spending time with the person of Jesus and trusting him through the process, what we find is that he weaves our story together way better than we ever could. What we find is that he leads us in goodness and in faith. We sang about it this morning. It wasn't your heart encouraged as you sing about it. Don't just sing about it on Sunday. Live it through the week. Walk through that truth of trusting God, no matter what the case may be. We trust him as he leads us through it. We trust that process of pruning. I think about what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 12. Paul, who God used in an incredible way, 2 Corinthians 12, 7, so to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Look at what he says, verse 10, for the for the sake of Christ, then I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Christian, I don't know your story. I don't know what you're walking through. I don't know what you're carrying. I don't know how loud the voices of stress and anxiety and difficulty are in your story right now. But I do know this. If you spend time connecting to the vine, if you spend time with the master, you can trust his hand. Even as he prunes things that you may not prune. You can trust him to help you walk through it. And you can say with the Apostle Paul, for the sake of Christ, then I am content with put in your trial, put in your tribulation, weakness, 
insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Once we have met with the person and we are in the process, we find that Jesus has a purpose for it all. Jesus begins to produce fruit in our lives. Lastly, we see this. The reason that we stay connected to the vine, the reason that we trust the process, John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. I think all of us this morning, we're here, we're gathered in church. I think all of us, if it was just us and Jesus, just us and the Holy Spirit, we would say, Jesus, we want to produce fruit for you. We want our lives to be examples. We, we want our lives to be like lighthouses. Lighthouses, uh, D.O. Moody said, blow no horns, they simply shine. We want our lives to shine with the fruit of Jesus. But we don't get to the fruit unless we're willing to trust the pruning process. We don't have the strength and power on our own to trust the pruning process until we spend time at the feet of Jesus. Remember Martha and Mary? Martha running around, cumbered about, anxious about much serving. And Jesus says, Mary chose the better part. For us, if we want to produce fruit, we have to start with this better part. Or I promise you, we will end in a place of restlessness, anxiousness, unsurety, doubt. What we'll ask God, not that it's wrong to ask God, what are you doing? But we'll so live in that place that we'll begin to doubt, God, why have you brought me here? An author that my wife follows and I begin to follow through her is called Claire Cleary. And she says this about the produce, the fruit that the Holy Spirit is trying to produce in us. And the opposite of that. She says, anxiety stems from underestimating the security sovereignty and supernatural power of God. That's why God's presence is the gateway to peace. You're reminded of who is in control. She goes on to say, don't wait for life to calm down before deciding to live from a place of presence with Jesus. There will always be a million things to do. The difference between a chaotic life and a calm life will always be in how you carry them. Don't accept the pressure that belongs on God's shoulders. I think for some of us this morning, we're carrying pressure that we were never meant to carry. And the invitation from Jesus is to walk into his presence. He's the vine, we're the branches. And to lay the pressure and the stress and the responsibilities and the labels, to lay it all at his feet. Spend time with him and then only walk away with what he places back into our hands. To trust that he knows best. I'll end with this story. It was 2022, at the beginning of 2022. January. And my wife's mom, her name was Nancy, got a call that she had stage four cancer. Many of you have been in that place. You've walked through this process before and we began to, as a family, try to make decisions and do things that would be helpful and, and supporting her. And there was a lengthy process, about six months, where she started radiation and got really sick. And as a matter of fact, Pastor Blake and Lisa were um, on our staff at that time, and they really helped by starting a meal train for my mother-in-law. And we got through the summer, and it seemed like she was really doing better and they said hey we did as much radiation as we could we're gonna give our season a rest we got into the fall and it seemed like she was doing so much better and we got around Thanksgiving we got into November and her health just really started to go we weren't sure what this was would look like we had moved to Las Vegas so that we could be closer to family we had two young kids both of them born in Las Vegas and we're just saying man 
what is gonna happen here? On December 1st, 2022, Nancy, my wife's mom, my mother-in-law, passed from this life to the next. If you've walked through that journey before, you begin to process a lot of different emotions. I remember one morning coming out, and I normally wake up early, it's about 5 a.m., and my wife was already up. She was sitting in our front room, she had her Bible out, she'd been up since 4, 4.30, just sitting there as she's just trying to trust the process that Jesus is calling her to. And so she started with the person, spending time in his presence so that she could walk through this season. I remember my son coming to me, Gatlin, after we called her Nana, after Nana had passed and saying, so where is Nana now? And we said, well, Nana's with Jesus. I remember him asking almost every night before he goes to bed, so Nana's with Jesus right now. And one day I'll go be with Jesus and then I'll get to see Nana again, right? We said, yes, son, you'll get to see Nana again one day. A couple weeks go by, we did the funeral, we did everything. We, Christmas was so different that year, New Year's. We got through New, New Year's. And on January 7th, my mom went to the ER, they did a scan. She was diagnosed with stage four brain cancer, my mom. And so I remember driving through the night and asking God as I crossed the desert, God, why, God, why? She's in Southern California and drove across the desert. I remember getting into the, getting into the um, hospital and as I went into the hospital, they said, listen, you can't wake her. She has emergency surgery in the morning. You can't wake her, but you can sit in her room. And I sat in the cold ER room at the foot of her bed as she lay there in the bed, not knowing what tomorrow would hold. And I remember just praying and asking God, saying, God, I don't know what you're doing, but God, help me, help me. Praying the prayer of my faith is weak. God, help me to just trust you through this process. I don't know what's happening here. I think you're pruning some things in my life. God, what, what is happening? I, I trust you. And she went into surgery the next morning and as she came out of surgery, the surgery was successful and my wife did a lot of work hauling around and got her into an elite hospital down in the LA area and um, Cedar sinai and they began to treat her and do all these things and uh, she went through several rounds of radiation and then a year's worth of chemo and I remember sitting with my mom at one point in the hospital as they had done the craniotomy and most of her hair was gone I'd given her a haircut the night before and sitting with her and saying mom is there anything you want to do they had predicted 8 to 12 months best case scenario and she looked at me kind of wistfully and said you know I never went to Hawaii I always wanted to go to Hawaii and so my wife and I talked and pulled everything together that we could. And for my mom's 60th birthday, we flew her to Hawaii and sat on the beach with my mom and just celebrated her life and how good God has been. I remember after that trip, just saying, God, whatever you have in store, we trust you and we love you. And just yesterday, when we were at Hershey Park, I FaceTimed my mom a year and a half later because she's still here and still with us. I don't know what your journey looks like right now. We've had two very different experiences and through both of them, we've just decided we have no other option but to trust Jesus. Without me, Jesus says, you can do nothing. And I'm telling you, if you're anything like me, you've probably tried to do it in your own strength. You've probably tried to walk through that, that family issue, that relationship struggle, that work issue. You've, you've probably tried to walk through it in your own strength. And as we come to John 15, what we see is that Jesus is saying, stop trying to do things in your own power. Just come to me and be with me. Connect to me. Rest in me. And what you'll find is that when you're connected to the vine and you submit to that pruning process, the fruit that you bear becomes fruit that only God can get the glory from. As we've walked through this process, we have spent time with Jesus and what we see is that he's producing fruit in our life, the fruit of patience. We're more patient with each other, with our kids, with our families, the fruit of love, the warm memories we have with Ruthie's mom, my wife's mom, the memories we're still making with my mom. There's a deeper sentimentality. There, there's a deeper love and compassion that we share as we walk through that. I've noticed that Jesus is producing the 
fruit of goodness and gentleness in my life. And I just want to pray this prayer over you this morning. So with heads bowed and eyes closed as we finish out the service this morning, I want to pray for you that you will spend time with the person of Jesus before anything else. Whatever he's calling you to, whatever he's walking you through, that you'll just trust the process of pruning and that what you'll see is he produces fruit in your life. Maybe you're here this morning and you say, as you talk about spending time with Jesus, I don't know. I don't know if I know him. I don't know if I've ever gone to Jesus and made him the gardener of my heart and my soul. I don't know if I've ever connected to the vine. And this morning, as you talk about trusting Jesus, I don't know what that looks like. And you're here. And for the first time ever, you say, I want to place my faith and trust in Jesus Christ with heads bowed and eyes closed. No one's looking around. If that's you, would you raise your hand so I can pray with you and for you? You're here. And you say, I don't know if I've ever trusted Jesus as my personal savior. I want to lead you in a prayer. Thank you. I want to lead you in a prayer real simply. It looks like this from the book of Romans. Here's what we learn. We need to believe in him and receive him. I want to pray with you real quick. Dear Jesus, I trust that you are God, that you came to earth as a man, that you died on the cross for my sins, and that you rose again victorious on the third day. This is the gospel. I believe it. And now, Jesus, I confess you with my mouth. I repent of my sin. I turn from my own way, and I trust in your finished work on the cross of Calvary. Save my soul. Connect me to the vine. Help me to trust in you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you're still here, let me pray one more time for the church. If you're here and you say, I need one of the last two. <laughs> I'm in the process right now, Pastor Caleb. I, I, I'm going through pruning and maybe you haven't even told anyone that yet, but you're going through the pruning process. I wanna pray for you. Maybe you say, I just wanna produce fruit. But if you're here and you're in the pruning process or you say, as a Christian, I wanna produce fruit. Can I see your hand? As a Christian, I wanna produce fruit. I want the Holy Spirit of God to live in me and dwell me and produce fruit. Hands all over the auditorium. I wanna pray for you real quick and we're done. Dear Jesus, these are my friends because they love you. This is a church called to follow you. Thank you for the pastors of this church. Thank you for the purpose of this church. Thank you for the passion of this church. For my friends right now in the pruning process, those that want to produce fruit, Lord, I'm trusting that you will, through your Holy Spirit, use them in a great and mighty way. And God will love you and praise you for it. We ask all these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Church, we're going we're gonna to worship in a moment. Will you stand with me? Will you stand with me? We're going to worship in a moment. We thank God that we stay connected in community. You know, earlier we sung about the love of God. And each and every week, we encourage you to truly seek the Father. Seek that vine. And in seeking that vine, we leave our chapel open each and every week for you to pray with. But uniquely in our church history, we have always left opportunities for those who are struggling coming to the vine. And so maybe that's you. Maybe that's a friend that you know. But next week, right here, we have a healing service. A service that will help people connect back to the vine. That will help them connect to a vine that they've never yet met. And so if you haven't marked it on the calendar, if you've yet to bring somebody, if you've yet to invite somebody, next week is that week.